The most important idea I have ever had was to go balls to the wall with music. To just say F it and jump. In 2009, a high school senior in Toronto had an idea. Jessie Reyes knew that she had a gift for writing and performing music, and she also knew that the only thing standing between her and her ambition was a foot in the door. So while she honed her craft at open mics, she made her goal her North Star and let it inform every decision from where she lived to what 9 to 5 she took. But despite her unyielding drive, it didn't happen overnight for Reyes. In fact, it didn't happen for years. But eventually, the confluence of her determination with her unique haunting voice and raw revealed songwriting created an organic groundswell. And before long, she'd find herself at the center of a bidding war and in rapid succession, a repeat collaborator with Eminem, tour mates with Billie Eilish, and a hired pen for everyone from Dua Lipa to Sam Smith to Normani. And it all started with one idea. How did your parents' professional life inform your creative ambitions? My mom did babysitting, so we, we, lived down, we lived upstairs, and the downstairs was like a daycare. And but she also did, like, she helped my dad all the time. My dad did, like, tool and dye, and also did ceramic, and also painted houses, and also made Colombian candy called Manjar Blanco, and would sell it individually, would make oleas, everything. Everything and anything they would do. Watching them hustle as hard as they did, watching them work two jobs all the time, watching them brush off my complaints about people making fun of my four-stripe shoe because it wasn't Adidas, and then telling me that shoe does the exact same thing, and saying thank you, God, every time that we were going to eat. Just little things like that made me so appreciative of what I now know and what I later learned was the norm for a lot of kids growing up. It just wasn't the norm. For me and for a lot of kids that grow up in immigrant families, like it's just, it's just a lot tougher, it's a lot different. And it just made me more of a f-ing hustler, made me more willing to grind, more willing to find a way when it didn't seem like there was a way, and more willing to work my ass off. Did you have anyone in your sort of immediate circle growing up that had creative pursuits in a professional way? My dad always played guitar at the crib, and my cousins did as well. But it was more so just like vibes. Like, I don't think they were doing auditions or busking and shit like I was, but yeah. And when did you start writing songs? I started writing songs in elementary school, but they started more so as poems. And then they were shit songs. And the first time I ever saw someone have a reaction to a song of mine was in high school. It was like after the first time I got my heart broken. And I was incapable of being in class or incapable of being in the calf because everything would just make me cry. So I would spend a lot of my time in the music room. And shout out to Mr. LaDuceur, who was my music teacher, who like, he would just, he would hold it down, man. He would like, he'd call other teachers and be like, she's not skipping, she's still in school, she's just in the music room. You know, like he didn't have to do that. He could have gotten me in trouble, but he would just allow it and let me stay there. But anyways, um, one of those days, my girl, Mona, she came to the music room with me and I showed her a song and she was like, holy shit, dude. It was just the first time someone had been giving me the holy shit response. How did you even know how to write a song? I guess I studied it, not knowing I was studying it. Like listening to so copious amounts of Destiny's Child and in an effort to learn the lyrics, going to like my one cousin's house that had internet at the time and like researching the lyrics there and and writing them out because they didn't have a printer and just being able to have them to know I was doing them right. You know, I think by default it taught me how just because I was trying to retain and learn how to sing the song, then I started understanding like what a verse was, what a chorus was, what a bridge was. My ideas come from God, come from spirit, come from energy, come from the prayers of the people who love me, come from energy of those I surround myself with, comes from life. Were your parents supportive of you pursuing music as a more serious activity and hobby? They were scared, but they were supportive, but they were concerned, especially because I would put myself in not the safest situations. Like there was a lot of meeting up with people online 
that had like studio closets too and similar aspirations and there was a lot of auditions and sometimes I'd have to go alone but sometimes you know my mom would come too or my dad would come too but there was a lot of that and it's obviously not the safest or whole, most wholesome industry that there is so they were concerned and my brother's like a genius like super he's, he's a teacher he's a scientist like you know well just very educated and I obviously was leaning away from school so they were concerned about that too and what gave you the confidence in high school to want to like start going on auditions and you know really put yourself out there in that way i don't know it might have been my dad my mom just watching them just not give a f and try things kind of made me not want to give a f and try things f and auditions sometimes they were rough sometimes it was very much giving don't call us we'll call you you know so it could have done a lot to my confidence real quick but what's nice is one of the times i went in and i had just started playing guitar and i did a cover and I did like, I'm going down, da -da -da, I'm going down, by Mary. And I was so nervous in the audition that they were like, okay, like, do you listen to a lot of like, what, what, like that song, like, why did you do it? And I was like, oh, I just love Lauren so much, like nerves. Obviously I know the difference. Obviously like, I loved Lauren at that point. Like just, it was the nerves that got me so bad. And I walked out of there defeated because I feel like I had just shifted. That was just rough. And this guy runs out and he's like, hey. And I'm like, yeah, and he was like, Listen, I know that was a little rough, but I feel like you have a lot of potential in your voice. Like, I would love to like work with you. And that's one of the first vocal coaches that I worked with. Maybe it was doing it and failing and still being able to find little nuggets that ended up being like the first bricks to build me up. I realized that early on, I think. So it made me less afraid of trying shit that I had a good chance of f***ing up. What was the goal in that moment in your head? Forward. Just any, anything, anything, that's... anything, anything, any audition, any collaboration, any opportunity, any time that like anything, anything at a bar. If it wasn't even an open mic and they had like a, f you know, a little elevated platform, let's run it. If we were downtown and a homie had a guitar, let's run it. If it would like anything. Because now, now I can articulate what it is. I can articulate like it's failing faster. It's it's projecting that sort of energy so the universe gives it back to you. It's, you know, all of those things. But when I was that small, I had no idea what the f*** I was doing. And I'm so happy that I did it anyway from wherever the f*** that influence came from. This is going on while you're still living in Toronto the first time? That you're starting to go on these first yeah. auditions and stuff? Toronto, Brampton, and then I moved all over the GTA. My dad had never wanted to settle in Canada but at the time it was easier to get papers for Canada than it was for the States. So their plan was always get the papers, get it figured out, and then go to Florida. But then some shit went down. It just made it more difficult to get papers for my pops. And then we had to do a different method and I got we got sponsored by my aunt, but we had to do it like, doing it the legal way is crazy. Cause if we were running away from something, like thank God we were in Canada, but if shit was crazy, we would have been fucked. It took like 16 years to get it legally approved and everything ready to go. And then he was like, it's a family visa, so you know, at that point I was grown, 20, I think. And he was like, if you want to come, come. And I remember I had like a Raptors cheerleading audition. I told him, I was like, if I don't make it, I'll come. And if I make it, I'm staying. And I made fourth round cuts. They sent everybody home and took five girls from the last bunch. And then they hit us with a, for the last spot, we want you guys to campaign. And I was like, nope, sorry. But then, because I'd done like Argos cheerleading before and I used to dance when I was younger too, but I was like, no, this is a sign. If it didn't come, if it didn't come naturally and I have to do this, then maybe it's a sign that I'm supposed to be in Florida. So I, I graduated and it had been a little over the year for the year off for college yes. and my parents are getting more and more nervous because it don't look like I'm going back to school. And I was working bottle service on Richmond, receptionist at this gym. It was like our Bally's. And then I was teaching Zumba, like dance and shit. And then I was doing cheerleading, all that. And then still doing like random internet link ups and sessions and open mics and stuff. But at the gym, this lady who was mad cool, she came in and I was reception. So I always like greet her and she's like, I brought my sister today. And I was like, cool. And her sister's chatting me up and she's like, you sing? And I was like, yeah, I do. She was like, you gotta leave. And I was like, what? She's like, you gotta get out of it. You, you can't stay in the city. Like, you gotta get out. You gotta leave. And I was like, what? She was like, it's not, that's gonna be the, like, it's not gonna happen unless you leave. You gotta leave. And I was like, okay. Like, it was kind of strange. No one knows, by the way. At that point in my life, I'm so shy 
that at these open mics and anytime I sing, my eyes are closed. And anytime someone asks to hear me sing, like, God forbid, if you asked me to sing, I'd make everyone in the room shut their eyes because I couldn't deal with the nerves. And then she left and the client came, but like the member of the gym came back and she was like, what did my sister say? And I was like, she, she knew I sang. And she was like, oh, you sing? And I was like, yeah. She's like, what else did she say? And I told her and she was like, you should heed her advice. And I was like, why? And she was like, she used to be a psychic. She said when she met someone and felt something intensely, she would tell them. And I was like, holy shit. So that, on top of not getting the audition right away, I was like, maybe this is God showing me that I'm supposed to bounce. So I bounced. Jessie left her hometown of Toronto for the unknown shores of Florida, hopeful that the proximity to the American entertainment industry would bring her closer to realizing her dream. But it quickly became clear that the opposite was true, and that the transition had actually killed the small amount of momentum that she had managed to build. Thankfully, an old friend secured her an opportunity to audition for a Toronto-based arts program called the Remix Project. Back home, surrounded by enthusiastic collaborators, she found the tools and the confidence that she would need to persist. So you end up moving to Florida. Does that immediately resolve or relieve any of these problems or change anything? No, not at all. It's funny because it's almost like I had to leave Toronto to be more hungry and appreciate the community that I had cultivated back home, doing open mics, doing all those things. Because in Florida, it was like starting from scratch and it was even harder because the culture there didn't lean into what I was like, I'm so guitar, a mutt, you know? But mm -hmm. but this, whereas at that time in Florida, it was like drugs, clubs, woo! And it wasn't really me. And I learned as I went and then same thing, like friending up the DJs and trying to get someone to play my song, which sometimes they did. And I worked at Gloria Stefan's club in Fort Lauderdale. This club called Bongos. I worked at a few different clubs. And Florida is actually where the gatekeeper thing happened to me early on. And Florida is where I ended up connecting like long distance with one of my first managers. You mentioned the incident that inspired Gatekeeper and obviously that ultimately yielded an incredible moment of creativity for you. In the moment though, did it demoralize you? Did it take you out of your zone? Of course. It made me put the guitar in the corner and look at it like a foreign object. It made me not want to touch it. It made me reconsider if I was chasing the right thing because the things that were said could have crushed anybody, you know? And it was said in such a lackadaisical, nonchalant way that I thought, holy f if this is it, and if this is the norm, and if this is what women have to do, then maybe I'm in the wrong industry because I'm not trying to do that. So I might just have to quit if I can't do it, you know? It definitely took me a second to pick the guitar back up and be like, I'm not gonna let this make me quit if I've been gone through all the other shit that I've gone through and all the auditions and all the interviews for one night to be the night that makes me quit ain't really the vibe. Yes, of course I doubt myself because I'm human, but I think that one of the most common threads in success stories is resiliency. So getting back up when something goes wrong or just getting back up from that doubt, you know, shaking it off and keeping it moving, but it's only natural that I would. I forgive myself for it. I show myself grace when I doubt myself. Was there a catalyst that got you back into music? I can't remember because it was all around the same time. Shout out to Jive and shout out to Doc McKinney, who was one of the Weekend's producers at the time. Jive was working with someone that had introduced me to him. And then we ended up staying in contact. And I was on a Skype call with him complaining about how tedious things had gotten in Florida. And he let me rail off and then finally he was like are you done i was like yes and he was like you need to do what you can where you are with whatever you got keep doing that because you're gonna force anyone around you to carry that same energy and then that day i linked with a homie who knew a homie in florida who had a camera and i was like i got this demo let's go shoot a video and then my first manager saw that one of my managers saw that video online and was like oh this is kind of dope the video kind of sucks but the music is lit because he was in video production and then he was like, this is, there's something called the Remix Project in Toronto and the Remix Project changed my life. It's a free music program for kids that don't have access to studio or access to a bunch of shit. And 
he was like, you should come by, just audition, you know, it's worth it. And so I got like a $50 flight on Spirit Airlines, begged my bar manager for the weekend off, flew back home, did it, and then I got in. And that, that being in there for those nine months shifted a lot of shit too, because it introduced me to the club, like to mentorship. And mentorship changes everything because this whole time, my whole life, like these dreams seem so far removed. They're on a screen. As much faith as I have, I haven't ever met someone that was living off of their art, you know? And having someone in front of you that's like, oh, your skin looks like mine. You bleed just like me. You breathe just like me and you're able to do it. It made everything so much more attainable. And then also watching everyone around me, you end up bagging who has the same hustle and who doesn't. And then it's reflective in how life responds to you. Because when you work hard, I believe that life, like, you know, cause and effect, you reap what you sow. Luck has played a big role in my success. I feel like I'm reaping a lot of my parents' good karma as well, sprinkled with reaping the benefits of the sacrifices that I've made early on that a lot of people don't see. Apart from work and apart from cause and effect and point A and point B, I'm aware that I've been blessed and I've been lucky too because there's a lot of people that work just as hard as me that haven't seen the success that I've seen. You're now in the Remix project working with these guys and you end up having a very unlikely collaboration with King Louis, yes. Chicago rapper. Yes. Tell me about how did you develop that relationship and, and how did it yield those two very interesting records? Sometimes people who deal with me, who deal with social anxiety, sometimes in the past I'd feel like hesitant to not wanna, you know, introduce myself first or shy or whatever you wanna call it. But I was working on it then and I walked in and the studio was full and I didn't wanna interrupt. So I was just like, hello, hello to everybody, whatever, shook his hands and then left. And Gav was in there. Gavin Shepard's one of the co-founders of Remix. But I left and then he threw on one of my records because they were playing like the participants' music. King Louie was about to speak. And so he walks out and he's like, you wrote that? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, that's about subtweets. And I was like, yeah. He was like, that's dope. And I was like, thanks. And then he went to go start speaking. And then at the end, his speech was beautiful. He basically said like, you just need to try shit. You just need to not be afraid of trying shit. When he was done speaking, his manager came up to me, dope. Who Doe I love too. And Doe was like, yo, Louis loves your shit. He wants to work. Pull up to the studio after. And I was like, bet, let's do it. And so then a few hours pass, and then we find out that they couldn't book a studio. And so we're going to somebody's condo in downtown. And then when we get there, we find out that they've invited a bunch of people. So it's me, it's Wonder Girl, it's Redway Rest in Peace, who was a great Toronto artist as well. Sean Leon, Spooky Black was there. Like it was a full f condo. And everyone there is equipped with beats, you know, equipped with shit. And it's me and my guitar and my nerves and Mauricio, who was the person who told me about was my, my manager, mm. my first manager. And I'm like nervous. And I'm nervous and I'm nervous and I'm sitting there stuck in indecision, not knowing what to do. And I'm like, you can't waste this opportunity. You can't waste it. Just like cacophony of sentences like bouncing back and forth inside my brain and finally I'm like you can't let it waste you can't let it you can't let it pass like this was given so I just burst out and I'm like you want to you want to jam <laughs> and he's like what and I was like you want to jam like we can go out to like you know we, we could just jam we can jam on the balcony because people are playing beats and he was like all right bet let's go and so he goes and he starts rolling up in the balcony and then I start finding these chords and then living in the sky I was born in the balcony of that Toronto condo and then He's like, this is lit, like, send it to me. Because of Remix, I knew how to work Pro Tools, so then they were able to get me a studio last minute, and then I engineered that shit by myself, produced the front half of that shit by myself, did my vocals by myself, and then sent it that night, because I understand the power of momentum. And I was like, if King Louis said now, and he's down and he's excited, now you gotta strike while the iron's hot, send that shit tonight. So I did it, and then I sent it, and then a few days later, he sent it back with his verse, and then we gave it to Moose, and Moose made that beautiful outro to it, and the rest is history, man. When you're songwriting, do you have like a specific method that you go to? I love just going in and going free. I hate walking into a room with a plan. And some people love it. And like there are legends out there that love doing that, that love like concept songs and concept albums and all this shit. But for me, it feels restrictive. For me, it feels creatively oppressive because I feel like all of a sudden there's a plan and expectations and I just hate that. So I love just walking into the room and just being open to the energy, to whatever the chords you're gonna bring out, to whatever, you know, that's always been the same. And I think that'll always be the same. It'll always just be like energy, vibe, and whatever comes natural. As a creative in this period, 
Do you feel like your voice and your vision for what you want to make is starting to come into focus, or were you already there? I was lucky enough to always be empowered to just be myself, whether it was at home or whether it was like professionally, I've been with people that have understood that I'm just me. And if my mom's not gonna tell me what to wear and what to do and what to say, sure, shit, no one else is going to, you know? The joke of doing this as a woman is also just an added layer of complexity because either you don't give a f but then you get criticized for being a b because that's the burden that we f carry or you're too f nice and then you get walked over and it's a dance you have to learn how to dance with like respect but f boundaries so people don't f with you but also being aware of that like that extra burden that we carry of getting those extra judgments you know it's a new skill i've learned to have more decorum and to also not feel guilty about no being a full sentence more often than not you find your manager, you guys decide you're gonna to work together as a yeah. team. He has no experience in this. You are relatively new to all of this as well. Yeah. What are the action steps for throwing day one? Throwing at the wall. And then uh, started to get a little hectic. Excitement started to come around my name. What are the things that you're witnessing happen that you start to feel like? Holy shit. Yeah. A DM from Calvin Harris. Well, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, a DM from Calvin Harris, and he's the one who was able to like articulate it because he messaged me and he was like, "Hey, heard your sh people in the city." So we're talking about LA. He's like, people in the city are really excited about you. Thought you should know. Sh got hectic. Sh got busy. It was just a lot to handle, and we needed more help. And Busy got involved. And Biz, who had shown Jermai, Jermai ended up peaking interest in BMG. And BMG was like, all right, we want to sign you as a writer, We, at, which is crazy, because like based off of strength, because I didn't have any credits, I didn't have any, no, no reason to merit the, the check that they were trying to offer. And I, at the time, and still, deal with paranoia. And especially because I was so green, um, the fear was taking over. And so I didn't want to sign sh I was so scared, but it worked in my benefit, but I didn't want to sign shit. So they courted me for nine months. Jeremiah just wouldn't let up. They sent me to Switz to Sweden to write off of strength because I'm not signed to anybody. So they're just buying flights for someone that's like not even tied, not even loyal, nothing. I ended up writing figures in Sweden, which is bananas. I write figures and then BMG throws the check and we make it happen. And that was the first like real check that I had for music was my publishing. So I started as a writer, technically. So you put that on SoundCloud and does it just naturally start to move? Yeah, it was wild watching the numbers, especially because we had done other things before. The numbers started shooting up and it was happening organically. Like, people were just sharing it. I feel like that was the tipping point. So how did the courting process go with all the labels? It was a bidding war, man. And it was a lot of tasty dinners and a lot of, uh, a lot of meeting execs. It revealed a lot of genuine relationships and vice versa. At that time, when we were looking for labels, Jeremiah is leaving BMG. He's now decided that he's leaving. And so these labels that are all bidding for me all find out and they're like, <gasps> and so then now everyone's trying to offer him a job because everyone assumes, rightly so, that they're like, this is her dude. When we found out where he was going, it just, like when we found out it was Island, I was like, well, listen, everyone's been mad dope, but this is my guy. Did you have the whole album completed at that point? Kiddo was done. Okay. Kiddo was done. That's why it was important to get someone that just understood and didn't want to just, we just need respect. Just respect, don't f with our sh just let us go. Kiddo was done. You put out Kiddo, it's a very successful EP. You have both hit records and also sort of cultural, you know, moments like Gatekeeper on there that really sort of set you apart from everything else that's happening in music. But then there's about three years between that and when you finally put out your first album. Mm -hmm. How were you changing? How were you growing? How was your sort of thinking about your career evolving during that, that period? So, Kiddo and then Being Human in Public was oh, the yes, second that's EP. Right. That was the second EP. And then that album. But I just changed a lot. But I was still very dark. Like, there's a lot of darkness in those first three projects. I was just growing. I was just living life, getting my heart broken, surviving. Being very candid about it. Yeah, I was just living life. Now with a couple celebrated EPs under her belt, Reyes was ready to properly introduce herself to the world with her debut album, Before Love Came to Kill Us. However, fate had other plans. Set to release at the end of March 2020, 
Much of the album's fanfare would be subsumed by the chaos and anxiety of the pandemic's early days. Still, over the next two years, she'd find peace and joy, culminating musically in the release of her sophomore album, Yesi, a title whose positive affirmation stands as an apt nod to the place she's in and where she's headed next. Your first album comes out at a very inauspicious moment in world history. <laughs> Leading up to it, you go out on tour with Billie Eilish yeah. and perform two dates right before a global pandemic shuts down mm -hmm. literally everything. Yeah. Ending the tour and also I would imagine the promo run for the album that you're about to drop two weeks later. Mm -hmm. What are the conversations that you're having with the label, with your team, with Billie's team? Everyone was in disbelief. Like, everybody was like, what the hell? But I feel like half the world was, you know? Certainly. I mean, shit, everyone was like, no way, come on. <laughs> I was ready to pull it. I was ready to cancel the album. And then I don't know what I was thinking. I should have known that this was going to be the answer, but I put it online. Because I was like, wait, I want to see if people, you know, understand that we should hold it back. And then everyone, it was like a resounding, like, are you dumb? Put this out. And so we did it. And, and it was scary because then we were just pretty much the guinea pigs for putting out a project in the beginning of what was going to be a f long f pandemic, but at the time we didn't know. But it was nerve wracking. And it was also weird because the ideas and the song, the, the messages, the meanings, a lot of the song ha songs had to do with mortality. And it was in, like after they were made, when we were compiling the album and I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, it's a catalyst for people to think about their mortality. But now it just seemed like all these songs called Coffin and Kill Us seemed more like theme songs to the end of the world as opposed to a thought, like a catalyst for thought of mortality. The content versus context was mangled. Did you feel like it was received differently because of? Of course, of course. I think it was Basquiat that said that if art decorates walls then music decorates time, who the f was making memories there? It was stuck inside their houses, you know what I mean? So like it was just, it was just weird. It was different. It's why this one, this project feels more like my first than anything, because it's the first time I'm actually like able to do everything properly, you know, God willing. I laugh a lot. That's how I process criticism. Sometimes it's not the best reaction, because I realize sometimes it can come from ego, but it also works as a defense mechanism, because sometimes people from the bleachers are very loud and they're not playing the game. So it works to your benefit to be able to kind of cipher through whose opinion you're actually going to take and whose opinion you actually respect. What did you do during the quarantine? Suffer, like a lot of the world get more lost in depression, but then I got so low that it got to a point that I was like, oh, it's, you heal or die. You sink or swim, it got dark. And then I um, started putting in the effort and I picked up The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. And I feel like it shifted me as a, as a person, as a woman, as an artist, it shifted everything. And I started just putting in time. I did this thing called Deepak Chopra's 21 Day Abundance Meditation that I feel like also deeply shifted me made me more aware of things, made me more aware of like just having presence and just life, just approaching life differently. You chased this dream for a decade. You have huge hit records, you have toured, you have multiple EPs under your belt and you're depressed. Was that tension hard to wrap your head around? At the time, yeah, because I couldn't talk to anybody about it because you end up looking like a brat. What, what was me? Whoa, well, is me. No one wants to hear a rich complain. The f I couldn't really talk about it. I was aware of it, so if I'm aware of it, I can only imagine how it would have been perceived. You know what I mean? So I tried to keep it to myself, but it was hard. But I was aware of like the irony of it all. Like your dreams are coming true and you're here crying over a broken heart that's like all encompassing everything. No, because that's not all of life. But when you're in the deep end, you don't really want to hear somebody say swim if you can't swim. And I couldn't swim yet. Success is freedom. Success is peace. Success is seeing the people I love, living a good life, seeing family happy, and lakes, and camping, and yoga, and goats, and horses. All that is success. When you look at the new record, do you see big changes in how you are articulating things, or how you're thinking about songs, or how you're thinking about expressing yourself? Yeah, man. I feel like there are more positive moments. The toxic ones are still there. 
very prevalent sometimes, but there's more positive ones that weren't there before. There's more openness to love, more willingness to be vulnerable, whereas in the past, I was more so coming from a place of fear because I'd gotten so fucked so often when it came to love, and then fucked in the remnants, like fucked in the ruins because I couldn't even deal with a broken heart. I didn't know how to fix myself. I didn't know how to heal properly. I didn't know any of that. And during these last two years, I just learned how to put myself back together to the point that it just made me less afraid to open up because even if I do fall in love with the wrong person, even if my heart gets broken again, I'll be okay. Is it hard to perform and have to live in those moments again after you've exited them? Sometimes, yeah, especially when they're fresh. It's so hard to sing when you're about to cry. It's the hardest thing because it's just an apple in your throat while you're trying to get wind through. It sucks, but it's a really interesting moment when you finally start to see success because then I'm crying because it hurts, but then all of a sudden I hear everyone in the room singing the song back and then it's this like stark contrast of like, but look at your life. Look at, look at what you've been able to do. Like, look at this connection, look at life. And it, it's literally like screaming in front of your face. So it's just, it's a f***ed up, uh, yin and yang kind of moment to just feel that little window and I'm right there in the pain and in the gratitude all at once, you know? Same side I couldn't sing before. I could like without feeling the need to cry and now I feel a little bit better, you okay. know? Now that I'm able to get through it, all right. Do you ever second guess how much of your life you're willing to share in your music? No, I don't. My experiences, and the betrayals that I've dealt with and the lies that I've dealt with pushed me into having a reflex for brutal honesty, which I've come to learn isn't the right way to be either because sometimes honesty without decorum is mean and then you end up hurting feelings and I don't wanna do that either. But it just feels right to be that way in my music. And if anything, I'm cognizant of like anyone who's in my life who's inspired something or like motivated me to, you know, to write or show up in a song, like I don't do names on purpose. Cause I'm not gonna say I'm this way in honesty at the expense of someone else. Cause it's not like they've made that decision. I've made that decision to be open and say it. It's just what it is. I'm a creative and I'm transparent and it's fine. It's just always felt natural to be open. You have a team now. How many people? Lots, dude. I haven't even sat there and counted, but this time around, we're running on two tour buses. So oh, okay. Lots. What is the key to being a great manager? I'm figuring it out still. I still learn, you know, but part of it is um, people aren't their mistakes, you know? People make stupid decisions sometimes, but it doesn't make them stupid. It just makes the decision stupid. And if you remember that, then it's easier to deal with frustrations when things go wrong. And also, nothing in life is gonna be perfect. And if you work with someone that does 80% of the time the right thing, that's a pretty good stat. And also celebrating wins, which I had before the pandemic, I had to talk it out in therapy. I didn't realize that I would flip tables when went left, but when went right, it was so expected that I never even celebrated. Having this album release party was something they had to bend I'd be f***ing up idioms all the time. They had to bend my <laughs> arm backwards mm -hmm. to get me to do. Because it, to me, it didn't make sense because I was like, f***ing, we're celebrating, we're done that. I'm just, I just finished the project. It's not out. We don't know how it's going to do. We don't know. And they were like, but that's irrelevant. How it does is irrelevant. It's the fact that you've been able to come here. You've been able to finish a piece of work that you're proud of, that you're happy of. So how it does is irrelevant to it. And there's also a massive team that's been able to get me here too. And it's in everyone's best interest to stop and take notice of the blessing that it is to live off of something creative. Live off of, you know, it's just, it's insane to live off of art. I know a lot of artists these days are selling off their catalog. This has been sort of a trend across the industry. Do you have any sort of strong feelings about owning your masters or owning your publishing or? I've dabbled. I've sold a, like a few songs, but not the whole thing. I believe in ownership, but I also believe in financial literacy and understanding money management. And sometimes it makes sense. If you're going to work it right, yep. if you're going to make the same amount in 10 years, but you have the same amount liquid now and you know and understand investments and stocks and 
real estate, for example, something that's a little bit more secure, then it makes sense to make that decision. And people can criticize all they want. A lot of times the audience has a lot to say or the bleachers have a lot to say and they're not the people dealing with it. But I don't think it's the wrong thing to do if you're handling the money right. So when you think about this stage in your career, what are your ambitions or your goals? Making my boys millionaires. The farm is still on there. For your dad? Founding an orphanage, yes. For Pops, your mom? Yes, the orphanage and, and, or a school. It's, it might take different forms because the more things grow, the more I understand like the, the kind of impact I want to have isn't so much adding something that's going to perpetuate that energy, but almost stopping before. So like working with families and maybe a school, like something like that. Luckily, like the third one on that list was always like impacting like a million people positively which is crazy because the kind of feedback that I've been able to get in my career is just a lot of love and a lot of like, oh, you did this for me or this song got me through this, which is crazy. Grammys still, because I miss smoking weed. <laughs> You've held to that? I've held to that, man. Because I said I was going to quit weed until I won a Grammy a few years ago. Peace, horses, goats, beach, lake, more time for myself too. Just more of what is, to be honest. I'm really happy which is f to hear myself say that because it's really been difficult for me in the past to find any sort of peace and contentness because I was always scared of being content because you could say that that's like the worst enemy of ambition, but I've learned to balance it. You know, ambition's not a bad thing as long as I'm not a d Ambition's not a bad thing as long as I'm not a maniac and I can still balance that and consider myself my own friend so I'm not running myself into the ground.